हेलो फ्रेंड्स एंड वेलकम टू द शो ऑफ बुक्स एंड थ्योरीज पॉडकास्ट जहां हम बात करते हैं बुक्स की एंड बुक्स में छुपी हुई थ्योरीज की बिकॉज आई थिंक दैट एवरी बुक हैव समथिंग हिडन इन टू इट हर बुक में कुछ कहानी है कुछ इतिहास है कुछ हिस्ट्री है एंड अ लॉट लॉट मोर थिंग्स इन इट आज का शो डिफरेंट है क्योंकि हम शूट कर रहे हैं मेरे घर के स्टूडियो में एंड आर गेस्ट इज ऑल्सो इन डिफरेंट कंट्री सो वी आर शूटिंग इट ऑनलाइन थोड़े ग्लिचेस आते हैं बस प्लीज मैनेज इट बट दिस इज बुक्स एंड थ्योरीज वे वी टॉक अबाउट बुक्स एंड लॉट एंड लॉट ऑफ थ्योरीज तो आज का टॉपिक बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग है क्योंकि रिसेंटली मैंने बुक पढ़ी द फॉल ऑफ एन एम्पायर पहला क्वेश्चन मैं ये पूछूंगा आप सबसे और कमेंट सेक्शन में बताना जरूर आप में से कितने लोग हैं जो विजयनगर एम्पायर के बारे में जानते हैं विजयनगर किंगडम के बारे में जानते हैं हमने मुगल्स के बारे में पढ़ा है गुप्तास के बारे में कुछ कुछ पढ़ा है पर आप में से कितने लोग हैं जो विजयनगर किंगडम के बारे में जानते हैं अगर जानते हैं तो कमेंट सेक्शन में जरूर बताना कि आप कितना जानते हो और क्या जानते हो और अगर नहीं जानते हो तो भी बताना कि आप इसको नहीं जानते हो ताकि हमको पता चले कि हमारा इतिहास कहाँ दबा हुआ है सो so, आज हमारे साथ इस पॉडकास्ट में है हमारे अभिजीत हेलेनिया इन्होंने बुक लिखी है द फॉल ऑफ एन एम्पायर ही इज अ सॉफ्टवेयर इंजीनियर बट ही इज ही इज पैशनेट अबाउट हिस्ट्री एंड टॉकिंग अबाउट एंशियंट कल्चर्स एंड इन दिस बुक्स इज टॉकिंग अबाउट विजयनगर किंगडम सो लेट्स वेलकम अभिजीत एंड आई वुड लाइक टू आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम अभिजीत ऑन अ शो ऑफ बुक्स एंड थ्योरीज पॉडकास्ट So hi Abhijit and welcome to our show of Books and Theories podcast. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. So Abhijit, uh, before we proceed, uh, it's just a general ritual. What I do, I ask my guest to actually introduce to my audience, because you have so much to tell me that you can explain that you can explain much better about you and why you have written this book about Vijayanagar Kingdom. Sure. Uh, I think uh, I'll start with something about myself. uh so i'm a for my day job involves the logic of engineering my true passion however was in basically storytelling so i was always fascinated with indian history indian mythology so which meant that i always wanted to write something about it so when i was a kid i used to read a lot of these books which were written about lord of the rings um say george r r martin steven erickson and all of these books are exploring topics about multiple countries multiple mythologies and everything but you never find anything about our own history or our own mythology and it's uh it's always dry so i remember when we used to read history it was very dry in the sense like you just read history because you want to uh get some marks and then score good marks and everything but there was nothing uh interesting about it so for me i think uh the history itself was very interesting so that is where my passion for writing and my passion for exploring indian history came into being uh so and the reason i wrote about vijayanagara empire uh, actually the fall of the empire is the third book in the series of books that i've written about vijayanagara empire uh the first two books were about krishnadevaraya who is considered to be one of the greatest emperors of vijayanagara empire uh this book is about ramaraya his son in law so uh during the time of vijayanagara uh, sorry during the time of krishna devaraya the vijayanagara empire reached its pinnacle of glory if you want to say but within just 40 years like because krishna devaraya dies in 1529 and ramaraya uh the vijayanagara empire gets destroyed in 1565 so it's a very short period of 30 years in which 30 35 years in which the entire empire collapses so what happened why did it happen was ramaraya the only person who was responsible for this could he have done something why did he do this so these are all the questions that always intrigue me because it's very strange to see that an empire just collapses uh, after such a great reign by a king so that is where my uh, interest came in and that is where this book came into being i guess abhijit one question comes in my mind because recently i was having a podcast with an historian talking about babar right then there was a podcast where i where i had a word with one of an author who talked about uh, gupta kingdom that's right now vijayanagar is a kingdom or an empire about which even i didn't know much before reading your book that's right and i think it's this is this is uh, something which is very strange that we indians we don't appreciate our culture Uh, I, I was looking into an NCERT book, and I realized that so there is hardly one paragraph written about Vijayanagar. That's right. So, what 
what's your view on this why vijayanagar kingdom is not been explored or not been taught to us uh well i think personally it's a bit uh, i don't know i wouldn't call it i don't want to use some strong words like bias or something but i always felt that the history of india is a little bit uh, tilted if i want to use that word towards delhi so it's always the history of delhi so which is the reason why you find a lot of history about kings of delhi like for example we have got chapters about the mamluks dynasty or even uh, mamluks khiljis lodis uh, and even uh, smaller kingdoms who were pretty much like nothing when compared to many of the other dynasties oh. so that's the reason i think one of the main reasons why vijayanagara empire is kind of lost in history so and the second reason i feel at least is uh, even though vijayanagara is so famous right so you need to understand what came after vijayanagara so what came after oh. vijayanagara was the maratha empire so oh. within a 100 years of vijayanagara shivaji established the maratha empire and maratha empire grew so it's pretty obvious that a lot of people just focused on the maratha empire because they were the ones from whom the british finally won india right so there is a lot more research on maratha empire there is much easier way to get uh, records and everything with vijayanagara it's a it's a bit more difficult to get enough records so i think that's one of the reasons why it has just fallen into the uh, i think crevices of history even though it's <laughs> it's one of the large it was one of the largest empires in india that's during its peak uh, so i was actually about to uh, come on this question only that to for an audience because you have researched a lot about this empire so can you explain what exactly was vijayanagara empire from where till where it was ex- uh, uh, it was expanded which which all areas come into it how how the governance happened during that time yeah if you can throw some light on these topics right uh, so i'll start with the founding of vijayanagara empire or at least the accepted theory of founding of vijayanagara empire there is a lot of theory so uh, the accepted theory is there were two brothers harihara and bukka bukkaraya these two brothers were basically uh, they founded the vijayanagara empire Uh, now uh, they founded the Vijayanagara Empire during a period when all the other dynasties of South India were pretty much on the downturn. Because what happens is um, Alauddin Khilji sends uh, Malika Fort to South India. There is an invasion of South India where most of the old dynasties of South India, like say Hoysalas, the Pandyas, the Kakatiyas, the Sevunas, all of them are defeated, and uh, uh, the Sevunas at least are completely wiped out, as well as Kakatiyas. and then hoysala somehow managed to stay by the skin of their teeth uh but what happens is in south india at that time there is a new kingdom that gets established called as the madurai sultanate that kind of destroys the hoysala empire now from this ashes of hoysala empire uh harihara and bukka kind of reestablish vijayanagara empire on the banks of tungabhadra uh, at a place called hosapattana or hampi as it's called now known so Vijayanagara Empire during its peak uh, ruled over probably the four entire states of South India so it ruled over most of Karnataka a significant portion of Andhra Pradesh uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala uh, parts of Kerala at least and then it also occupied Goa uh, along with that uh, at least during the time of Devaraya which is the second uh, uh, Devaraya the second who was the uh, king of the Sangama dynasty uh we seem to have evidence that vijayanagara armies had marched all the way to sri lanka and occupied at least the northern portions of sri lanka or at least obtained the submissions of the king of northern portion of sri lanka uh so if you so that's how large vijayanagara empire was so it's pretty much the entire south india if you want to call that so that's how big vijayanagara empire was so that's a bit interesting in the sense like the vijayanagara empire didn't really have a Uh, how do you call it as a single type of administration at least it didn't start out like that so it like all empires right it over a period of time it evolved into multiple types of administration so i'll start with how it started so when it started it was basically a bunch of brothers so even though the history says that there were two brothers but there were actually five of them so they split the up harihara the empire. and bukkara hai na this is right. in 1336 so Yes, that's right. So Harihara and Bukkaraya are the two ma- people who are mentioned, but uh, recent uh, records have mentioned have pretty much concluded that there were three more brothers, 
so Mudanna, Marappa and uh, one more brother. Uh-huh. So it was like five brothers and the empire was pretty much divided among themselves. And then later on what happens is uh, Bukharaya comes to power and then his son Harihara the second comes to power. Under Harihara what he does is he kind of removes his cousins from out of power and appoints his own sons into that position. So he kind of centralizes the power. Okay. Uh, over a period of time what happens is that centralization again begins to be decentralized wherein a lot of local rulers called as the Nayakas. Uh, are created. So these Nayakas are probably similar to say the, I wouldn't say they are not like Mansabdars of Mughal Empire, but rather the Amirs of the Delhi Sultanate. So these guys had, uh, they were military governors. They were expected to maintain a army for the, to be called into war whenever required by the king. Uh, and they were allowed to pretty much rule the their portion of the territory. Uh, so when uh, this goes on till uh, somewhere during till 1485 when uh, the Vijayanagara empire becomes so weak that one of these uh, uh, Nayakas uh, so called Sangama uh, sorry Salua Narasimha Devaraya he basically overthrows the Sangama kings and he becomes the next king so from Salua the dynasty moves on to the Tuluva dynasty which is what the Krishna Devaraya is uh, famous for so under Krishna Devaraya, uh, the empire is pretty much fragmented among all these Nayakas who initially start out as say smaller uh, smaller feudal lords. But by the time of Krishna Devaraya, some of them become powerful enough to have uh, their own armies and pretty much semi-independent status and trying to get fully independent. So uh, under Krishna Devaraya, what happens is he tries to centralize the power. He changes the way the empire is run. He creates what is called as the Durga Danda Nayakas, who are basically military governors that are based out of cities. And also he kind of divides the Nayakas into smaller Palegars or uh, Palayams, as he calls them. Calls them. Uh, but because he dies in 1529, most of his reforms don't uh, stick. So which means that uh, the period following, immediately following that, the Nayakas again become pretty much semi-independent. And Ramaraya's, uh, the reason why Ramaraya comes to power is mainly by the support of many of these Nayaka families. So these Nayaka families are the ones who back Ramaraya and their pound of flesh for backing him is to have a pretty much semi-independent status. So that is where uh, Ramaraya is when during the Battle of Talikota with a lot of feuding uh, feudal lords who are, well, I, would, I wouldn't even call them as feudal lords because by that time most of them are kind of uh, semi-kings, even though they are not really independent yet. So that is where, uh, uh, that is how Vijayanagara was. Uh, okay, so so one, one, one question which comes to my mind, uh, while reading your book, uh, I keep on researching, uh, it's, it's my habit. So I came to know that uh, there was a controversy also regarding this, uh, this man called Harihara and Bukha. Yes. That they were actually the commanders of uh, Kakatiya dynasty. And Absolutely. later they got converted to Islam mm-hmm. and then uh, that the Islam rulers sent them back to South for some sort of treaty or some uh, some discussion regarding the war. When they came back, they actually converted back to Hindu uh, mm-hmm. and formed this dynasty, Vijayanagar dynasty and uh, th- th- something like that. So is it, is it true or what the story behind this? So it is one of the theories. The thing is, it's one of the theories, but that's not the only theory. Uh So there is other theory which says that the Vijayanagara kings were basically feudal lords of the Hoysala dynasty. And the supporters of that theory can pretty much say that. The reason why they say that is because when Harihara was crowned, right? Uh uh, The queen of the previous Hoysala king, Veera Ballada, she was actually the person who who placed the crown or who was a chief king. Chief guest, if you want to call that, of the ceremony. So, so the another theory says that these were basically Hoysala feudal lords who became the kings. Uh, I don't know. The thing is, right? It's just one accepted theory that they were kings who were basically they converted to Islam. The, the issue with that theory is, right? Um, like we, I think the modern society is pretty secular. So, so we can assume that these things can happen, but I'm not sure how secular the society was in 
15th century where a person comes he converts into a different religion and then immediately comes back and then reconverts and then suddenly commands the loyalty of a significant portion of vassals because you need to understand right when vijayanagara empire came in, comes into being it is supported by pretty much a large number of vassals of the hoysala dynasty the vijayanagara empire is basically starts out from hoysala territories oh. so it's a bit str- uh, like if you are making an argument that these guys probably came back and then they were converted and then they reconverted it's it's going to be a little bit difficult for them to convince people to stand behind them uh, i mean i'm not saying it's not possible but it's still a very difficult story to sell so it's oh. their origin story is one of those things that is um i think it is still lost in history we are not sure there is way too many theories and way too many uh uh theories that are being proposed and it's not helped by the fact that everybody wants uh the modern i think modern politics plays into ancient history like always in indian uh, history right in india we the history is not like our past doesn't define us but rather our present defines our past which means that we try to change the past based on based how on we present. want it to be so which means that uh, the origins of vijayanagara becomes a little bit tricky by that uh, definition and so and- i don't know personally i am not convinced that it is possible but uh, should that it's i mean it's it's possible but is it probable is something i'm not convinced So there, there is uh, in one of my recent podcast, uh, someone was just telling about Vijayanagara Kingdom. Uh, although it was a talk about Mughals, but what he described that once a Mughal uh, emperor sent one of his commander to Vijayanagara Kingdom. Mm-hmm. So that commander, how he has described uh, Vijayanagara when he reached back to I think Aurangzeb or someone or Babur, uh, how he described Vijayanagara was that. the uh, vijayanagara kingdom is so big that uh, the, the complete palace of mughal uh, is just a part of that complete vijayanagara kingdom he explained like uh, on the road he can see like uh, uh, jewels and uh, gold was selling like they were selling like vegetables these were the words that that mughal commander actually narrates to the mughal king yes yeah. so, uh, so some light on this So uh, yes, so Vijayanagara Empire was a very wealthy and very uh, popular. So, for example, right, uh, the city of Vijayanagara Hampi, which is from where the name of the empire comes in. Although the name of the empire is probably not Vijayanagara, at least the contemporary record seems to say that it was probably called as the Karnataka Samrajya or Karnata Samrajya. But uh, Vijayanagara Empire is how it was defined by the British. So. let's stick to vijayanagara empire so the capital city vijayanagara right during its peak uh, was considered to be the second largest city in the world uh, i think uh, the city along with its environment had like roughly 300 to 500000 people so which is a significantly large city for that time period so they had some of the greatest water networks so you had aqueducts that was bringing water from far away regions into the city and uh, as you mentioned the city was surrounded by multiple rings of fortifications and uh, it was a very wealthy and very powerful city so you i wouldn't be surprised if a visitor comes there he sees this city this is this massive uh, fortress massive city with the so many people it shows its power pl- splendor and prestige so i wouldn't be amazed if it's uh, i wouldn't be surprised if he's uh, amazed seeing something like that although i'm just curious uh, i'm still a bit curious as to which uh, general it this would be because uh, if it was during babur's time then it would be krishna devaraya but uh, if it's, it is aurangzeb then i think by the time it, vijayanagara uh, empire i think was, it's 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 about babur because the yeah. discussion what i was having is about babur so, so it is babur then yes yeah. so if it is babur then yes during when babur comes to india i think it is 1515 15 is what it we are talking about 1515 15 oh. or 1520 so that was era's time no that is krishna devaraya krishna devaraya yes yeah so krishna so that was a period when vijayanagara was the most powerful empire of oh. india at that time so krishna devaraya was the single most powerful king uh, of that time of india at that time and and what the what contribution this vijayanagara empire has done in the literature field 
lot of things right so a lot of uh, like with respect to the telugu literature uh, if you see telugu literature there is a lot of works that was there there were somebody called as there are krishna devaraya had eight great poets called as astadiggajas who wrote multiple works about in telugu uh, uh, literature before that during the period of the sangama kings there is a lot of kannada literature that is being done uh, even the carnatic sangeet as it's called right the carnatic music uh-huh. so that was originated during the time of vijayanagara so the entire carnatic music which whose father is known as purandara dasa is called as the father of carnatic music and purandara dasa lived in the period of vijayanagara he lived during the time of krishna devaraya oh. so krishna devaraya uh, was a great patron of art and culture and everything as were other kings so yeah so the period of vijayanagara was a great uh, time for kannada literature and telugu literature Okay, so, so coming back to your book, uh, while I was reading this book, I can say that I, I can imagine and I can feel the complete story. I can I can actually see the complete story. That that's the beauty of this book. Uh, but one thing comes to my mind uh, because generally what happens nowadays, especially nowadays, we authors have started writing a lot of historical things, a uh, yeah. lot of political things, and to construct a story, we have started adding adding fictions into it. so what percentage yes. of fiction is available in this book or i can say it's a purely a non fiction book uh it's not a pure non fiction book there is at least half of it is i mean the historical events are all uh, mostly accurate uh-huh. uh but some of the interactions and all aren't very uh, are not historical so you can say dialogues are non fiction yes or, but no, but no, the, the dialogues scenario... are fiction. sorry sorry the dialogues are fiction But the scenarios, most of the scenarios are non-fiction. Yeah. So the complete fall of empire, what you have narrated, that happened truly as it is. Just the interaction part, as you can say, it's a non-fiction part. Yes, that's right. So, like uh, the book mainly takes its uh, inspiration from half, like a few historians. Uh, some of them is uh, uh, Richard Eaton, uh, Manu Pillai, and uh, also uh, Venkat Ramaya and all of those historians. So. it is pretty much a mix and match of a lot of historical records so it wouldn't be faithful to one his any one historian but it's uh, it has been picked up from multiple uh, historian so that was the question actually i was about to come on that yeah. see writing writing and historical fiction or or a non fiction about history it's a bit tough so yes. recently i was as i said i was having a podcast about babar then i have for gupta empire then i had an podcast for anarkali so whenever someone is writing about all these uh, historical topics or characters uh, it, it requires a lot and lot of research work so right. wha- how you have researched about an empire about whom there's not much written about so like like i was talking to her shali she is an author of anarkali so she mentioned that she reached to the museums the ancient libraries she pulled out many text uh, akbar nama and all those things and then she finally correlated all the dates about anarkali so yep. so how how was the process about this the fallen empire how you have managed to research all these things is just google or there is something else you have done into it i'm asking um, this because because for the budding author it's important to understand how the research work is done for a book that's right so uh, for as i mentioned the fall of empire was the third book in the series of books that i have written so which meant that i was doing a research for the vijayanagara empire especially for krishna devaraya uh, the two book series of on krishna devaraya that i have written previously so which meant that the fall of empire was a natural progression for that so with respect to the research itself right so i started with uh, at least for this book i started with the aravidu vamsha which was a book that was written by father henry haras he was a indian historian during the 1930s and 40s he is considered to be one of those uh, seminal writers of uh-huh. vijayanagara empire so it's from i started with father henry haras his book is pretty widely available then i went on to read other books from contemporary authors like richard eaton and once i was done with that i went ahead and pulled out some books from ferista who was a uh actually uh i well i wouldn't call him as an eye witness account because he wrote it like 60 years after every you think but i read the farista tarike farista which was the english at least uh, english version of that 
then i did read the burane mazar uh, which is the um, book that was written by during the time of buran nizam shah who was the grandson of uh, hussein nizam shah so uh, so that is also i read so basically i tried to read some of the near contemporary works at least the english versions of that so that i could get a fairly uh, accurate picture of what was happening and then with respect to the dates themselves it was not as difficult as uh, anarkali because ramarayas uh, the problem with thing is what we don't know about vijayanagara was the early periods by ramarayas time there was multiple accounts that were available so which meant that it's a little bit easier about uh, researching on ramarayas at least his dates and everything coincide very well compared to say i don't know i mean i'm not sure how much it would take to research on anarkali because uh, while she's popular in the bollywood movies, uh, movies <laughs> i'm not sure as a historical person there are, there are no was, facts about her there are nothing yes, about so her yes so with ramaraya it's not like that because uh, we have significant amount of information we have his the, i mean he has got we have got even his uh, records in a lot of books we have information of all the grants that he has given to a lot of villages and everything so it's not as if we don't know who, like what how uh, ramaraya's story unfolded over the years so and it's it really all... unfortunate that for the person whom we have so much available uh, still we don't have anything uh, for our kids to teach they don't yes. even get uh, just a single paragraph <laughs> <laughs> so it is available the uh, the thing is indian history is the issue for me is it's always availability that i mean i understand because india is a vast country which means that there is so many regions of india so many uh, portions of india which are never covered like for example i'm pretty sure you would haven't have heard of lachit borpukan and all the ahom dynasty or even the probably the gurjara pratiharas or the pala dynasty the rashtrakuta dynasty the cho the chola at least we have got a new movie so hopefully uh, the awareness has increased at least with respect to the chola dynasty so through my podcast i am again again trying to reiterate after doing so many podcasts about historical facts and i am really re- uh, realizing after doing this podcast there is so much into our history which is either tweaked yeah. or hidden and i really want to bring out these things for the youngsters like like uh, I, uh, as i said because i am too much amazed by hearing about babar uh, like babar is uh, being being kid when i was in my school days or even my son who was studying history babar is created mm-hmm. like a hero we have we have read about him we have seen movies about him it, it's an image of a hero has been created in front of us whereas if you go and read about babar nama where he himself has written that today i have went uh, to one of the kingdom i have i have cut hundreds of heads and i created a i have created a built a tower of those heads that the cruelty of babar is but we have never been taught about that we have been only been taught that babar was yep. a hero we 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 were we are taught we were taught like taj mahal is one of the uh, most uh, prominent and a beautiful thing ever built but we forget that taj mahal was built on the money of uh, indians it was built by indians the, all all the laborers yeah. were indians so uh, all all the money was of india so how can it be of moguls yes. similarly if, when i'm not sure about it because i have not been to south much but when i compare lot many temples which are built by vijayanagar kingdom and uh, some other other empires as well in the south which are so beautiful and architecturally yeah. so perfect that somehow i feel that taj mahal is nothing in front yeah. of them but still we are not uh, appreciating those cultures and those artifacts so w- what's your view on this part yes as in uh, i think as i mentioned i think earlier in the podcast right i mentioned that uh, in most countries uh, the history is basically what impacts the future in the sense like your past defines your future but in india it's the other way around that the present actually defines our past which means that it depends on how you want to look at the past so we are way too much uh, worried about uh, what will have what impact it has on the present to actually do an accurate reading of the past which means that 
a lot of the reading in the, of the past is done in a very i think a, with a lot of preconceived notions so that is where you find this strange events that happens in in our history so i think that is one of the main reasons oh. what happens with uh, you mentioned the lot of temples right so vijayanagara empire did build a lot of temples but the second thing they also did was they constructed ramparts around the temple so if you go to a lot of south indian temples you will find that there is a rampart around the temple so there is this when you go to the temple oh. you can't directly enter the temple there is this wall that surrounds the temple and then you enter the temple so those walls many of the walls were constructed during the time of vijayanagara empire and they were constructed mainly because to make it difficult to be the temples to be raided so that oh. was also one of the things that vijayanagara empire did uh, so as i mentioned uh, the madurai sultanate which ruled over uh, portions of madurai and everything that was considered to be they ruled over like i think around 60 years and they were one of the most brutal of the kingdoms of that period and uh, vijayanagara empire pretty much wiped them out completely and uh, they uh, like so i the thing is right i am a bit uh, it's a bit difficult to uh, generalize that somebody some particular person or some particular community is cruel or something but the madurai sultanate even ibn batuta mentions that they were extremely cruel and violent so which means that uh, yeah so they were destroyed but uh, vijayanagara history if you see it's a history of a kingdom that sprang during the time when all other regional powers were demolished they came in they adopted a lot of new things they adopted a new technology so for example uh, the cannons as a lot of people say that cannons were introduced in india by the moguls i'm not sure even if they still people are discussing oh. that but the reality is cannons were not introduced in the moguls um, even before that the bahmani sultanate and vijayanagara empire were fighting using cannons the battle of raichur which was happened in 1520 was one of the largest battles in south india and that involved a lot of cannons and even before that there were cannons that were used oh. by both vijayanagara empire and uh, bahmani sultanate hmm there's something the history is tweaked a lot so uh, one thing always comes to my mind that we authors we are also um, somewhere uh, uh, i'll say uh, yeah we have some biases and we are also responsible for tweaking the history why am, why this question is coming to me i'll tell you if, if we if uh, generally uh, like i know ramayan because i have seen ramayan and sagas ramayan i think you must have also seen it okay and that's the phase in the very early childhood when we have seen ramayana or mahabharat so that image that story is in our mind now that phase of ramayana or mahabharat which which we have learned is different now someone from the generation of say in, in 2000s they would have read uh, the trilogy yes. uh, written by amish that gives a different prospect of complete um, um, uh, hinduism and about uh, yes. shiva okay now while i was reading the yes. original ramayana for i was i'm just reading it for one of my show which i'm trying to come up with i came to know that ramayana was actually first narrated by uh, mm-hmm. valmiki ji it was never written he he actually narrated yes. in shlokas and that he did before the birth of ram right you know that yeah i didn't know that he narrated before birth of ram and he narrated to vishnu ji you know hari bolte hain and he said that you are the perfect person who should take birth as ram and teach people on earth about the good and bad and then there is some story behind it and then hari uh, vishnu ji decides that okay i'll take a birth as ram and then he takes a birth as ram and then this complete story happens and then tulsi das writes uh, ram charitramanas yes. so this is the real right. thing okay. about it so uh, my purpose of telling this is like everyone who narrates a story brings yes. a tweaks to it okay and that the reason that story or history slowly slowly gets changed yes. okay now coming to my question actually now like you have written a book about vijayanagara you said that okay 50% is fiction 50% is non fiction yes. okay 
similarly when i was talking to someone else there was there was because nothing was available on arkali most of the things she tried to pull out from the historical documents and some non fiction into yes. it and built up a story now the youngsters who are reading maybe someone who is mm-hmm. reading fall of empire how you ensure that that person should not consider this as a or or my question would be like what you will suggest is it a history or is it just for entertainment okay so a little no, tough question i'm saying so i'll say as a historical fiction writer right so a lot of historical fiction so the at least the term historical fiction itself is uh, gives it away right there is history as well and there is fiction as well oh. so it depends on how much history you want and how much fiction you want so it could be even if you call it as historical fiction maybe it just has the names which are historically accurate but everything else is fiction uh but oh. in a lot of other books the historical events are all maintained maybe a little bit uh dialogues and everything are added just to make it a little bit more interesting so in my case at least uh the history aspect as as i mentioned earlier the flow of history is maintained especially what we see the death of krishna devaraya and the rise of ramaraya is pretty much accurate like you have ramaraya who uh, who struggles with achyuta devaraya who is krishna devaraya's uh, successor no i i appreciate that in your book all these dates and historical uh, narration is perfectly matches because while reading i was i was researching as right, well right right and i can, i can i can manage to match those things yes so which meant that i tried to be as accurate as possible i mean i'm not claiming that i myself don't have any biases i might have my biases <coughs> but i have tried very hard to ensure that at least the sequence of events occur as they are uh but at the same time because it's a historical fiction which means that my characters need to have motivation because every writer can tell you right his characters oh. must have motivation i am not uh, as a fiction it has to be a story you are actually telling a story so it's not a history textbook so which means that my character ramaraya has his uh flaws if you want to call it his strengths his weaknesses and his uh, ambitions his failures everything so you are trying to see the story of the vijayanagara through the eyes of a man who wanted to live it i i always feel that felt that ramaraya wanted to live vijayanagara in a place much better than how he found it but instead he kind of was unable to do it rather he failed to save the empire that he fought with his father in law to so, save it uh, so w- one last question on the fall of empire uh, why exactly this empire uh fall matlab is just because of the misadministration or it's something else so okay it's a bit tricky question so what happens if you see the history i mean you need to read the book no, i have read but, it i uh, just want to uh, is, bring this question out for my audience no yeah. no no, no. <laughs> for the readers yes the readers have to read the book so uh in in general terms what happens is the reason why the empire falls is because the deccan sultanates who are these dynasties that sprung up after the destruction of the so Bahamani sultanate and this is very very uh, good in this book that you you come to know that the even the sult, uh, sultans of deccan they are in very good treaty as well with the with the vijayanagara empire before so it was nothing like hindus or muslims yes, what yes. we see nowadays it was actually a very good treaty which they all have together yeah that's right so uh, uh, yes and no so the the issue here is right what um it's again the same issue in the sense like we are trying to uh, attribute a single aim or a single interest to a particular king or a ruler so what that me what i'm trying to say is you might have more than one reason to do us do something let's say you are trying to like let's say a thief he might have more than one reason to steal something so the issue here is uh, we are so scared of actually exploring anything we try to say that oh either it is only for land or either oh. it is only because of religion it's a mix and match of both uh, but you're right the kings did have a lot of treaties so that is the fa- that is the very interesting part so the for the 25 to 30 years of ramaraya's rule uh, basically vijayanagara and all the deccan sultanates pretty much play a chess game where oh. everybody is changing sides and after every battle they keep fighting among each other they patch up they become friends 
and then they again patch up and then fight with someone else so it goes on for 25 years and then finally uh the deccan sultanate decides that okay let's all unite and attack vijayanagara empire and at that time rama rai tries to fight back but uh, unfortunately he fails and there is multiple reasons for it i think one of the main reasons why he fails is because of the decentralization that oh. i al- already mentioned which meant that we really don't know how much uh, actual control of vijayanagara rama rai actually retained in the sense like uh, even though he was the titular well there was a titular king which was a sadashiva raya and rama raya was his uh, chief minister but the rest of the palegars or the nayakas they did uh, acknowledge him as the rulers but we don't know how much uh, independence they exerted so the battle of talikota or battle of rakkasatangadi as you want to call it you can see that it was rama raya his brothers who were leading armies and all of them were way way past their prime so from the historical records we know that rama raya was probably in his oh. 80s if not 90s so he had absolutely no business to be fighting a battlefield he wasn't even supposed to be anywhere oh. close to a battlefield but because rama raya had some mistakes if i want to call that during his uh, reign even see the thing is you need to understand during rama raya vijayanagara was had become the most powerful kingdom oh. of south india so his reign wasn't really a uh, Uh, as a lot of people try to call it it wasn't really a dark day for vijayanagara in fact vijayanagara was doing very well till the last till the battle of talikota oh. vijayanagara was doing very well so krishna deva uh, i think he was ramaraya was at the same league as krishna deva raya wherein he divided all his enemies made sure that they fought among themselves and he lorded over all of them as the supreme oh. king so till the end he was he was successful in his uh, mission so it was only in the end during that battle all of his mistakes and all of his uh, prior decisions came back to haunt got it got it so there is lot and lot of things into our history so so what what's your next book all about right. again a vijayanagara kingdom or something more uh i am deciding actually so the thing is uh, i'm while i'm very fascinated with history i am uh, thinking of writing a high fantasy novel based on indian mythology uh that is one uh, thing i'm thinking right now but at the same time i am uh, interested in writing uh, exploring a book about a queen called uh, abaka oh. so so this uh, she is called as uh, the pepper queen of india so she was a queen who fought against the portuguese so her story is very inspiring and interesting so this is a time i think during this uh, oh. 16th century or rather i think 17th century where she is she is actually the queen. she's from not really right? ruling for a oh. yes coastal yes, karnataka she is from coastal karnataka so yes so she fights against the portuguese uh, she fights actually three wars against portuguese and then she defeats them in two wars and in the and she is captured in the third war and then she dies trying to organize a prison riot trying to escape to organize a second round of resistance against the portuguese so it's a very interesting and very inspiring story of a person who just refuses to accept uh, domination by mm. basically foreigners so <clears throat> that is one thing i'm uh, considering but at the same time i'm uh, thinking of writing a high fantasy novel which is uh, going to be based on indian mythology but uh, it wouldn't be based on ramayana and mahabharata i would want to write my own uh, i want to build my own world if you want to call that so yeah let's see my my goes. best wishes because even i have tried to build something and Thank still you. still working on yes but, yes. but what happens when you try to build yes. a world yes. uh, it it becomes a responsibility to keep yes. continuing with it but we as an author what happens uh, right. other ideas keep cop- popping up in our mind so like where well, like when i started up rhythm project right. i decided that i'll continue with the eight parts without any interruption any other book i did for part 1 part 2 right. and after that something popped up in my mind, mind and i came up with she is the then again something popped up in my mind and i came up with you are still the one and now the third one sunflower lily is coming yes. up and i am still struggling to finish my third book of rhythm raja <laughs> <laughs> yeah that 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 always happens actually so uh, it's very difficult to Uh, uh-huh. stick to a project so yeah i but i do tend to work on at least two projects at the same time so which means that um, 
like once I finished one project, I just let it be there for some time and then I start working on something else and then revisit the previous one like after a few months because I feel that if I re-edit, uh, if I start editing the novel immediately, I'll be I'll be so deep into it that I will fail to re all, realize all the mistakes or all the errors that I would have done. So fresh mind is required, so which means that, yeah, I changed oh, my no, that's the, uh, novel completely. Definitely. I know for me, it's, it's getting a little tough nowadays because that's right. I believe that when you write something, yes. it should be properly researched. I that's think if right, you have read my right. book, Radham Roja, you should have seen that how much research I do into it. Now for me, uh, doing these podcasts is actually a research work. So when I was, I was about to discuss with you about Virginia Kingdom, I, I researched a lot, read a lot of documents because I don't want to come in front That's of right. you, an expert about this topic and sit like an idol. So I, I, whatever to topic I need to discuss, I, I first go and research into it. So that time which I would have given yes. to research my book, I actually I do for these podcasts. So, uh, yes. by my time, I am getting very little time to complete my books. So, this is where I am lagging to manage Rise of Now. But hopefully, I will be, uh, because my next target is to finish Rhythm Roger 3. That is that is the target I have taken with me. Okay. And you have, uh, like you have started writing it or you are somewhere in between it? No, no. I have started writing it. I have just written one or two chapters. Um, oh, right. Yes. But uh, those ch two chapters I have written a long back, almost six months back. So, <laughs> this, I'm still not able to come up into that pace of writing. So, yes. because in between, yes, my, yes. My, my next book is about to come. So, a little busy with the editing work also. So, that's the reason that's I'm not getting that complete time or complete concentration to complete that book. Correct. And your uh, book, the coming, the book that is coming out is with Srishti Publications as well? No, that is from Fingerprint. Correct. Prakash Correct. Books, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm in a contract with Prakash Books as of now. But yes, hopefully oh. Rhythm Roger will be coming from Shesti only. So, we are having some discussions. So, let's see. Let's hope. That's nice. That's nice. So, um, what, how, so, audience, uh, I have read this book, The Fall of an Empire. You must have listened to us talking about Vijayanagar Kingdom. There is a lot more about it when you read this book. You will actually, Jitna aapne sunana hume bolte hue, you will start feeling those, those era, you will start feeling those people, that, that particular kingdom, the way that this has been explained in this book. So, I will suggest that go and pick up this book because this book gives you insights of the Vijayanagar Empire. And an empire, I will not say the fall of an empire, but I will say a lost empire. Ek aisa empire jo humari history mein daba hua hai, jiske baare mein humko itni information nahi hai. And I, I hats off and I, and I congratulate uh, Abhijit for writing such a beautiful book. And bringing up these stories to us because these are some stories which must be narrated to to everyone, to the coming generation, so that they should know what India is and from where we we are we have come till this age, and that is very important. And this is one of the book which which gives you that feel of being an Indian. So, uh, Abhijit, you want to add something to it to the audience? Uh, yes. So, uh, yes. So, I would just say that yes. Just to pick up the copy, and then I've done my best to do um, justice to Ramaraya and his character. Uh, so, and as uh, Himanshu mentioned, there's a lot of about Indian history that we are still uh, trying to research. And I would suggest that a lot of young authors just come in, pick up this thing, uh, and then try to be uh, try to come up with your history, like try to enter Indian history because I think. The Indian history field itself requires a lot of young blood because at this moment I feel that uh, our history is still not really written by us. Uh, it is still being uh, contested, it is being discussed, it is being debated. So a lot more young blood would mean a lot more different opinions will come in, which is actually good. Any opinion and multiple opinions about the same king, say, for example, if somebody wants to write again about Ramaraya from a different point of view, I would welcome that because that will help me also understand where I my, my I have let my own uh, writing lead me. So there might be a different viewpoints, a different way that people think Ramaraya stories uh, should have been. So I would suggest that just for all young readers or, or wannabe writers, just come ahead, just go go deeper into your research. So yeah, and. Make sure that we 
highlight our history for our younger generation and and one more thing i i, I forgot to highlight uh, the cover it's beautiful i think wasim has wasim has designed this cover yes and the, this character the, this is uh, krishna rao or rama rao this is supposed to be rama raya he is a little bit younger for that but yeah he is uh, rama raya but uh, yeah he is a little bit younger for uh, rama raya but you can say that he is a, a younger yeah. gen- like it's the younger story of rama raya when yeah, rama raya was younger so you uh. can see his uh, traditional uh, attire the kala kulavi as it's called as the cap hmm. the peaked cap of vijayanagara empire so which they never get it right i mean there are half a dozen serials that have come on vijayanagara and they always show krishna devaraya with the cap that looks a little bit like a mogal cap tipu sultan or, yeah or akbar tipu sultan yeah 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 or tipu sultan's cap so they never get yeah. the kulavi which was actually what was over worn during vijayanagara empire right so oh. yeah and i had so that's what i'm saying that the, the the way he has designed right it's, it's very beautifully yes. and researched well researched character he has done it. yes yes it's a very well researched uh, Yeah. 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 No, but, uh, thanks thanks Abhijit for being on this show and discussing about your book. Uh I I really appreciate and I really congratulate you for writing such a beautiful book and I am I'm, I'm I wish and I wait I'm waiting for your next uh, book to come out so that I can read it because there are few authors whom you once you read it you start loving it to you love to read them further yeah. and you are one of them so I, i really love to read you further yes. so thanks for being on this show if you would have been in my studio i would have asked you to do a book dance with me <laughs> but uh, unfortunately we time. are not together <laughs> maybe next time when you are coming to india will you have a book dance <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> So thanks thanks again for being on the show mm-hmm. and guys if you have not subscribed this channel please go and subscribe this channel i have already placed link of this book in my description box so please go and buy this book it's just hardly i think 199 or 149 190 yeah. over amazon yeah, yeah over, over amazon it's, it's, it's a, such a penny in front of the history what is have so please go and buy this book and enjoy reading the history of india Yeah. Till then bye bye and be on the show of books and theories thanks abhijit for being here thank you himanshu it was a pleasure being thank here thank you thank you